increasing mutation. Inspecting population. I'm sure the vast majority of you are familiar with SimCity, the original city building simulator put out by Maxis, which kind of defined an entire generation of software for that company, as pretty much every title they released was Sim something or other. Well, funnily enough, they did have a handful of other titles which weren't Sim titles, and today's ancient DOS game is one of them. Unnatural Selection, which is still technically a simulation game anyways, but I'm guessing Sim Geneticist just doesn't have the same ring to it. Now this game is kinda, but kinda not what I was expecting. Whenever you delve into a more modern game with genetic manipulation as a core theme, it tends to focus more so on the genes themselves, dealing with dominant or recessive genes, which can be active or inactive, selectively breeding things together until you get the combinations you want, reaching a stable genome, which isn't going to suddenly fall apart due to particular genes being left over. And it's something I kind of got a bit of experience with through modded Minecraft with the forestry and extra bees mods, which were a thing long before bees were officially added to the base game, and I've since played a couple other games which utilize these basic genetic concepts. However, Unnatural Selection doesn't have any actual gene manipulation at all. Instead, it's just a numbers and mutation game, with the goal simply being to make your numbers better through selective breeding and good old fashioned radiation, so that when it comes time to pit your creations against your opponent's creations, yours will be the one who win the day. Because there's no actual genes being tracked here, the game ends up feeling surprisingly shallow before too long, or if you're playing outside of the sandbox in the game's top secret missions, ends up being far too difficult due to how those missions are presented. Loading cargo. Unnatural Selection was developed and published by Maxis in 1993 and is effectively a one-player simulation slash strategy game, although definitely leans more towards the simulation side of things. Now, unlike most Maxis titles, which tend to support higher resolutions or multiple audio devices, this game only supports VGA 320x200 256 color graphics and only supports the Sound Blaster and Disney Sound Source for audio. As for its current release state, it's one of the few Maxis titles not yet available on digital storefronts, at least at the time of making this video. Thus, the only way to get a copy is physically, which thankfully isn't too difficult a prospect. In fact, when you go searching, you're typically going to find a fair amount of copies available, almost all of them will be fully boxed, and while some sellers try to charge an arm and a leg, the typical going price isn't outrageous, but it isn't low either, generally going for between $30 and $40. Now that said, there does exist an exceptionally rare CD-ROM release of the game, which I don't think was out for very long, like, not even the Moby Games website knows it was a thing. But I know it exists because I've seen photos of the jewel case and the CD itself. Now because of how rare it is though, I have no idea if it had any special features over the floppy disk release, and I've otherwise found no information about it. Also, before we get to the main gameplay, I should show you all a quick unboxing of this thing because there's actually quite a bit included, starting off with seven 3.5 inch floppy disks, each of which is completely missing its write protect tab to help ensure the disks never get altered, a very thick 132 page manual, which is um, surprisingly unhelpful, which is something we'll get into in a bit, a fold out quick start guide, the Maxis Maxims warranty and support card, an offer for a free six-month subscription to a magazine of the time known as Strategy Plus, and half of the registration card, as someone actually did send this one in to the Maxis at some point in the past. When you first start up the game, you're presented with this screen here, which lets you choose between the two main modes of play the top secret missions or independent research, the former being the game's main story mode, the latter being the sandbox mode. I guess we should go over the main story, but really, it's pretty inconsequential, given the fact that you're almost certainly going to be spending most of your time in the sandbox mode. The main story has you taking the role of a Dr. Ted Jackson, one of three scientists who've been working on a genetically manufactured species known as Theroids for the purposes of putting an end to world hunger. The other two scientists being Dr. Andy Andrews and Dr. Ingrid Skinner. However, right before the breeding program was set to begin, Dr. Skinner, and many of the theroid specimens being worked on, suddenly disappeared. 
The military was called in to figure out what was going on, and six months later, both Dr. Jackson and Dr. Andrews are brought aboard an aircraft carrier and told that the theroids have been detected on several uninhabited islands, and reason that it must be the work of Dr. Skinner since no one else had access to the data or materials to do any of this. Since there's a fear that these theroids are being bred for nefarious purposes, and that they might end up being unleashed into populated areas, the military reasons that, instead of trying to nuke everything, the better approach would be to fight a mad scientist with another mad scientist. Thus, they have converted a huge portion of the aircraft carrier into a controlled breeding habitat and laboratory, so that Dr. Jackson and Dr. Andrews can put together their own army of theroids to obliterate the ones bred by Dr. Skinner. Now, let's step away from the story for a bit and go over what exactly is going on here, because there's a lot to take in, despite how surprisingly simple the method of gameplay is. When you first go to the lab, you're presented with this screen, which has a whole lot of buzzwords and indicators and adjustments and stuff. The manual attempts to make sense of all of it, but is surprisingly bad at it, offering up a quote-unquote tutorial, which tells you what to do, but doesn't really tell you why you're doing it, and a massive reference section which again mostly goes into what you should be doing instead of explaining why you should be doing those things. I swear, despite the size of the manual, it's incredibly difficult to look up the exact things you want to know, and in fact, there's a few aspects of the game which don't even get explained at all, and I'll point those out when they pop up. But to give you all a quick rundown, there are effectively two modes of play, the Digilife Laboratory and Combat. This here's the laboratory, with the big section in the top right being your theroid breeding pens. This section here is the chronometer, showing the in-game time in 24-hour format and the in-game day. These two buttons highlight and count which theroids are actively fighting each other and which are mating. This red gauge here uses radio frequencies to control how fast the theroids are acting, with the off setting effectively placing them in stasis, while the max setting is the same as the full setting, but also runs the simulation as fast as your computer can handle. These three buttons are the zoom level, which I'll get into in a bit. The disk drive here lets you access the main menus to load and save your progress, as well as set up other things outside of the main story. And then these four buttons here determine the rest of what gets displayed across most of the lower half of the screen. The habitat controls are used to inject artificially created theroids into your breeding pens, up to nine at a time. You can set up the stats of the resulting theroid however you want, but are limited in how strong you can make it artificially, as you need to rely on natural breeding to get even stronger theroids going. Now, how you set up the stats also determines the kind of theroid you get, with the initial three possibilities being fast-moving orange zips, super-strong green hulks, or long-lived blue slugs. Now, normally, this is just a visual thing, but there's a very small number of secondary mechanics where the type of theroid is important, such as when a helicopter drops a theroid or piece of cargo onto another theroid or piece of cargo during combat, as whichever is heavier will be the one which survives, and weight is tied specifically to the theroid's type. There's also two more types I never got to see, beasts and tanks, as they're locked off until later into the story missions. Now, a quick thing I should point out is that, for the most part, the left and right mouse buttons do the same thing, but dropping theroids into the breeding pens is one of the extremely few aspects of the game where the two mouse buttons differ, with the first mouse button dropping theroids one at a time, and the second drops as many as there's room for. Now, since the mouse buttons can also pick up the theroids when you're manually moving them around, this can get a little clunky. But these two buttons let you adjust the walls and food in the breeding area, whereby you can raise or lower walls along any lines between two adjacent grid points, horizontally or vertically, and food can be designated to pump into or be removed from any grid space you indicate, with the food adjustment here indicating how much food to supply to each designated spot and how often. Now, keeping in mind, there are no limits to any of this normally, though in the main story, you are limited to how much artificial creation of the theroids you can do per mission, which is where those numbers beside the stats come into play. The last thing with the habitat control is the radiation level. Now, this is where the whole genetic manipulation aspect comes into play, as normally, when two theroids mate, the resulting offspring will have a mix of the parent's traits. However, using radiation, you can cause mutations to occur in these traits, which can alter the resulting trait by a particular amount, either up or down. 
The drawback, though, is that higher radiation rates also have a higher chance of causing the offspring to carry a virus, which you can then pass on to more offspring if you're unlucky. But even if it doesn't, these viruses greatly reduce particular stats, and then those reduced stats can get transferred as well, even if the virus itself does not. And the three virus types which could occur are X, Y, and Z, with X reducing stamina, Y reducing vision, and Z reducing the mating drive. Actually, let's talk about the stats next, since that's the main purpose of the view controls. These controls allow you to highlight specific theroids to get information about them and what they're doing. Plus, the left side of the panel shows you the highest numerical stats out of all the theroids you have, including what the highest fighting drive is, the highest mating drive, the highest eating drive, the highest speed, highest strength, highest stamina, highest vision, highest momentum, and how many theroids have one or more viruses. You can also click on these numbers to sort out who's got the best stats indicated or who's got viruses. You'll also be doing a lot of your zooming in from here so you can monitor what's going on more closely. At the middle zoom factor, it becomes a bit easier to tell what everything is and you can visually see what's going on. Whereas if you zoom in fully, you get to see animations of the various theroids doing their thing. Now, supposedly these theroid animations have been done in a claymation style, but it's actually surprisingly hard to tell. In fact, some of it looks too clean, despite the compression and dithering to be strictly claymation work. But then maybe the people doing it were just really freaking good at getting a less clay look out of the clay? Either way, there's a variety of animations depending on what's going on, all of which have ridiculous sound effects to go with them. I mean, just listen to some of these. <laughs> Also, the combat is surprisingly bloody when it ends, so maybe don't watch the close-up zoom if you're squeamish. Actually, truth be told, the novelty of zooming in wears off pretty quickly, and you otherwise won't ever be seeing these animations. So despite the sheer amount of effort which was put into them, it's ultimately a throwaway aspect of the experience. Back to the stats though. The first three, fight, mate, and eat, all determine how likely the theroid will get the desire to do those things. A high fight rating means the theroid will want to fight other theroids more often. A high mate means it will often want to go make babies, not necessarily with your own friendly theroids when in combat. And a high eat means it will often go searching for food when there's none in the immediate vicinity. The speed is how fast the theroid moves and acts, which includes how quickly it can attack in combat. Strength is how strong the theroid's attacks are. And stamina is effectively its life essence, which goes down over time, as well as for every moment where it wants to do one of those three main actions, but is unable to. Vision affects how far ahead the theroid can see, and thus higher vision makes it easier to fight, mate, or forage for food at greater distances, and plus keeps it safer from dangerous terrain elements during combat, while momentum is one of those stats that's never explained, and I was never able to figure out why it was so important. And through my own testing, I think what momentum affects is how much variance there is for mutations, thus why it's not referenced during combat, since radiation mutations don't occur during combat, and are thus not necessary to track at that time. The census panel basically just gives you a running count of your theroids, as well as what behaviors they're engaged in. While the database panel is used to sort through your theroids more exactingly, grab the specific ones you want, and either plop them wherever you want in your breeding pens, or just flat out kill any you've grabbed as the simulation just really isn't designed to handle exceeding large quantities very well. So you want to try to keep some level of control over what's going on and where. Generally speaking, if you go over about 600 theroids, you got too many, and it's going to start getting much harder to track and breed them appropriately. And yeah, what it basically comes down to is using all of these tools and information to breed the best theroids you can with the highest numbers you can. Although sometimes you actually want to do the opposite. For instance, the X virus obliterates stamina, and without stamina, a theroid will die surprisingly fast. In fact, so fast that it almost becomes pointless trying to breed for anything but stamina early on. However, once you have an X virus present, you can intentionally breed a stock of theroids carrying that virus, preferably with a high desire to mate, then introduce them into enemy theroid populations during combat to try and pass that virus along to help decimate your opponents. 
In fact, I think doing this is pretty much required in the story mode, for reasons we'll get into in a moment. Other than that though, I've noticed the drive for fighting is surprisingly unimportant, since you can safely assume enemy theroids are going to want to fight back during combat anyways. However, the drive to fight also leads to certain theroids eating other theroids following combat. Thus, a theroid which loves to fight can actually get away with having less stamina under those conditions, but then most theroids avoid cannibalism, meaning they won't eat theroids of the same type, and that just complicates things even further. It, there's a lot of stuff going on here. <laughs> And I should point out too, the game's independent research also allows you to adjust the game's assumptions and underlying variables, something you can't do in the story mode, which allows you to experiment even further with all sorts of wild possibilities, though you can set these back to defaults easily enough if you mess them up and can't figure out how they started. This also helps to give some keener insights into what's going on under the hood. It's showtime, Jackson. Are you ready to go to battle stations now? Now, you're not breeding all of these creatures just for the heck of it. You need to clear a bunch of islands of Dr. Skinner's steroids, and this is where the combat aspect comes into play. When combat begins, you're presented with a map of the island and can see all of the theroids on it, with enemy theroids always being displayed in darker colors compared to yours. Basically, the goal is to deploy your theroids and hope they can fare better, but you do have a few tricks to help give you an advantage. First, you need to select a chopper to load up. You have three Sea Stallions and three Sea Knights at your disposal, with the Sea Knights able to carry virtually twice as much stuff, but are also roughly half the speed, meaning it takes them longer to reach their destination and takes them longer to return following. You can load a chopper either with Theroids from your lab, you can evacuate Theroids presently deployed so you can take them back or deploy them elsewhere, or you can load in cargo, which primarily comes in the form of four kinds of food, normal, lust, rage, and bran, and two kinds of tools, decoys and noisemakers. You also have a special C-130 Hercules in orbit, which is able to supply a limitless amount of normal food, but has some weird quirks about delivering it, as you have to indicate where to start a food drop, then click in one of eight directions away from the initial drop point to determine which direction to drop food along, and it's supposed to be possible to drop more than 20 units of food at a time, but the manual fails to explain how to do this. Just that you're supposed to stretch the line or something to that effect. And once the C-130 uses up its 80 food units, it needs to resupply before it can be sent in for more food drops. Now, the four different kinds of food do have some purpose to them. Normal food works exactly as you would expect. Lust food causes a theroid eating it to immediately desire to mate. Rage food causes the theroid eating it to immediately desire to fight, while Bran is interesting in that it immediately causes a desire to eat, which is what the theroid was already doing, but provides no nutritional value on top of that, meaning that it effectively wastes the theroid's time and helps to starve it out. Thus, your Bran is best used early in a fight to help delay the enemy theroids from building up their numbers. In terms of the two tools you get, decoys are stationary objects which fool a theroid into thinking it's something to fight or mate with, though when the theroid fails to do either with a decoy, it'll go do something else. Basically, a good tool for distracting theroids away from places you don't want them to go. While noisemakers create a small zone around them which repels theroids from entering for a short while, thus can be used to push them out of a particular area or into areas you'd rather they be in. The trick with either tool, though, is that even your theroids can be affected by them, so you need to be careful about when and where you use them. They're probably going to be spending most time in combat simply watching the scoreboard and seeing how things play out. The graph basically shows your forces versus the enemy forces and is a rough gauge of how well you're doing. Although, just like when in the lab, you can zoom into the action to see things closer up or can get right up super close for the claymation visuals. Unfortunately, there's no way to speed up the combat any faster than what you see, and I'm not really all that surprised. Given the computers of the time and what I've witnessed of how the game plays in the lab when set to max, I don't think a max setting here would have been much faster for a typical 1993 computer. No, throw a Pentium from a couple years later at it and that would have absolutely made a huge difference. Fortunately, with modern day emulation, you can just fast forward and that'll do the trick. In any event, the battle is won when no theroids remaining are enemies, as in they're all theroids you bred yourself, or which carry an affinity for your theroids following mating with an enemy theroid, at which point if you're in the story mode, you'll go back to your lab and progress towards the next island, or if you're running independent experiments, the simulation just keeps going. 
you, you just gotta go stop it manually. But yeah, the reason you're going to be spending most of your time in the independent experiments and not playing the story is because the story is exceptionally difficult. And even the devs knew it, as the manual makes note of the spike in difficulty. The reason it's so difficult, though, has nothing to do with any of the mechanics I've explained up to this point, and actually goes back to something I just sort of nonchalantly pointed out at the start of all of this. The chronometer. I would say to get a decent batch of Theroids going, able to do considerable damage to your opposition, takes about 6 hours of in-game time, which will go by a lot faster than that of course. However, between each mission in the story mode, you only get half an hour of in-game time to breed up new batches and try to improve on your creations, minus the start of the game which does give you some extra time, but not with all of the lab's features activated, and mutations aren't even allowed until very close to the start of the first mission. Now true, every time you get to an island, the colonel explicitly asks you if you're ready for the mission, and you can say no. But, if you say no, the next time the colonel calls, you are forced into combat, ready or not, and more importantly, the difficulty shoots up even higher, giving you half as much food to work with and making the enemy theroids even stronger. Seriously, the story mode is intentionally built to be completely insurmountable to anyone who doesn't intimately understand every little thing going on with this game. You either play the story mode perfectly, or you fail on your first or second mission. Period. Overall, Unnatural Selection is an interesting game for sure, and allows for a kind of experience which is extremely uncommon in terms of pre-2000s gaming, as the concept of being directly involved with genetic manipulation is a rare mechanic to find back then, or heck, even nowadays, as only a small number of games which incorporate it. However, it's certainly been done better since, especially since this game focuses too heavily on the numerical side of things, rather than on incorporating proper gene mechanics. And don't get me wrong, I understand why they did it this way too, given that this is a real mode game, not a protected mode game. So it's extremely limited in terms of how much memory it can use to run the simulation. Like everything had to be made as simple as they possibly could to fit it all within conventional memory limits. Like The game does have expanded memory support, but it's only for the assets, since it would be far too slow to run the simulation variables through it. Well, heck, just based on the stats the Theroids have, my estimate is that each individual Theroid only has between 12 and 16 bytes of data. An army of a thousand of these should only be taking up around 16 kilobytes of memory at most. Well, unless I'm missing something about how the simulation is working under the hood, but I think I've got it all figured out. The major failing of this game, though, as a game, is the extreme difficulty of the story mode, as it's completely arbitrary as a result of how little time it gives you to actually make any decent progress, instead forcing you to do the most optimal things you can as fast as you can, and preying on RNG to do the rest for you. To that end, this plays much better as a sandbox experience than as a game, which is par for the course as far as Max's titles are concerned, but certainly something to be aware of before you decide to seek out a copy for yourself. As mentioned earlier, since the game doesn't play in protected mode and benefits from a solid boost in cycles, you're probably going to want to manually set the core to dynamic, and then set a fixed cycles count which best represents how fast you want the game to go when you set its own internal timing to max. I decided to go with 50,000, but really any cycles count of 30,000 or higher should do the trick, since if you want to go even faster, you can just hold down Alt F12, which is the default key combo for fast forwarding in the DOSBox emulator. Anywho, that'll be all for today's episode of Ancient DOS Games. Next up, two Saturdays from now on April 27th, we're going to be doing a pro video. This time taking a look back at an overhead 2D shooter to see how balanced or not balanced its different stats are. So be sure to stay tuned as we take another deep dive into an old favorite of mine. Thanks for watching everyone, and extra special thanks to everyone supporting me over on Patreon. If you'd also like to support the show directly and get some extra perks, then head on over to patreon.com slash k-a-s-i-c-k.
Okay, okay. So somehow I ended up with two complete copies of this game. I mean, this one over here came from the owner of the DOS games website, but where the heck did this other one come from? Oh, that explains it then. Jeez, whenever Clint sends me stuff, he generally sends me a lot of extra things too, and this was one of those extra things I completely forgot he sent me. So, um, yeah, this is the first and hopefully only time I make a mistake like that. Though at least we get to see the full registration card here, because the one in Clint's copy was never mailed in.